Okay, so we're in section five, which is uh, graphs as sine and cosine functions. So last time we we evaluated the sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent functions, and we did it from all angles <clears throat> by using the um, position x y in a coordinate plane to define the the terminal point of the line segment that defined the angle. So there's another way of plotting sine and cosine is to do them separately. When we did it in Cartesian coordinates, we were basically plotting both the sine and the cosine for an angle. And <clears throat> uh, But if we do this, um, if we do them separately, what we're going to have is instead of a graph of both of them, we're going to have a graph of one and so what we'll have here is x or theta or t depending upon how we represent it and up here on the y-axis we'll have the sine of x or the sine of theta or the sine of t um, so let's see how that works so let's kind of go back and review what we know so far so remember that we know the uh, sign for each one of these five values of theta in terms of radians and they were 0, 1 half, the square root of 2 over 2, the square root of two, 3 over 2, and 1. And remember it was basically the square root of 0 over 2, the square root of 1 over 2, the square root of 2 over 2, the square root of 3 over, the square root of 3 over 2, and the square root of 4 over 2. Kind of a quick way to remember those things. And then for the sine, we have the opposite. So the cosine of 0 is 1. And then we go, instead of to 1 half, we go to the square root of 3 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, 1 half, 0. So they're kind of mirror images of each other. Now what I'm going to do now is instead of plotting these, these were the coordinates basically on the unit circle and these were the values of the angle either in degrees or radians. What we're going to do is we're going to plot these as a function of uh, the sine of theta as a function of theta. So if we were to do that with the values that we have for sine we'd have z, x theta equals zero we'd have zero. So these are the x values and these are the y values. At pi over 6, we'd have 0.5. At pi over 4, we'd have square root of 2 over 2, which is 0.707. Uh, at pi over 3, we have square root of 3 over 2, which is 0.866. And at pi over 2, we have 1. And if we were to plot a line with those five points, it would look something like this. So it starts off with a fairly constant slope, and then it starts to decrease its slope until it gets to a zero slope here. Now the question is, what? How would we do this for the rest of the um, the domain that we're usually interested in, which is usually is from zero to two pi? So here we're from zero to pi over two. Well, if we go from if we evaluate the sine from pi over two to pi, obviously they have to match up. So, and we have this symmetry because of the circle is symmetric and well as the reference angles and things like that. So it should have a symmetric behavior. And likewise, when you get to um, theta greater than pi, that's moving into the third and fourth quadrants, which are negative. So you see similar behavior, but on the negative side of the axis. And then from pi over three pi over two to two pi, you have the symmetric part, and then you start all over again. For angles greater than 2 pi, you just start the circle over again. So that's what the function would look like if you were to plot all those points. So we've plotted from 0 to pi over 2 to, just, to establish the shape of the curve, and then we've used symmetry to continue with the curve. And you can also see that as you go from 0 to 2 pi, once you're after 2 pi, you start over again. If I take this here and I'll, you know, it's going to sit right over top of it. So that's what the sine function looks like. And it continues on from 2 pi to 4 pi. It'll go through another 
what we'll call what we call the oscillation. Four pi to six pi will do the same thing. If you go the opposite way from ne uh, negative two pi to zero, it'll have the same shape. So we have this repeating behavior of the sine function. So um, also if we take these four pieces, you can kind of see how they, you know, the symmetry that you have this symmetry. So let's, let's talk about domain and range. So for the function, the sine of x or the sine of theta, the domain is all real numbers. So I'm going to show it. That is this. So it's from negative infinity to positive infinity because this thing just keeps repeating itself. The range is fairly limited. It's from negative 1 to so the sine of theta, that's or sine of x, um, that's the y value, is going to be between negative 1 here and positive 1 there. It just keeps, like I said, oscillating. So that's the domain and range for the sine function. So after you've traveled a, a full period, or one period, a period is the time it takes, the amount of time it takes, or the amount of x value it takes to have one oscillation. And for just the sine of x, that period is 2 pi. So once you get past 2 pi, you start all over again. And if you were to draw a horizontal line, you'd see that every 2 pi, you get exactly the same value at any point on this curve. So, and also you'll notice at 0, we're moving up through 0. Here, we're moving up through 0. We move through 0 here, but we're moving down. So you, you think about the value and the direction you're moving. That happens, repeats itself as you go through a period for this function. So we, we call uh, this point the maximum because it's the largest value, largest positive value. So the maximum for the sine function is 1. The minimum is negative 1. And you can break it up into four parts. So you've got the quarter period. Um, so this from 0 to pi over 2 is the quarter period. The half period would be from 0 to pi. From 0 to 3 pi over 2 would be 3 quarter period. And from 0 to 2, two pi is a full period. And notice that I'm using radians. So usually when we plot the sine function, it's a function of theta or x. It's not a in our radians, okay? So these are typically radians and not degrees. When we deal with triangles, and even when we deal with the circle and um, angles there, we deal kind of equally with with degrees and radians. But when you're plotting uh, the sine function as a function of theta, it's usually radians instead, or just radians. Not that we couldn't do it, but it's now the cosine, you know, if we go back to this original thing, the sine went from 0 to 1 as you went from 0 to pi over 2. The cosine goes from 1 to 0, and it kind of has this reflect, you know, it starts on 1 and goes to 0, and this one starts at 0 goes to 1. So the sine function, not surprisingly, looks very much like the cosine function, except we start at 1. After pi over 2 radians, we go to 0. But then we can keep continuing decreasing until we get to a minimum. Then we turn around. Again, symmetry. Go up to 0. Go to 1. So you can see at pi over 2. And if I added 2 pi, I'd have uh, 2 pi plus half a pi. So 2 and a half pi or 5 pi over 2. We have the same symmetric behavior. And again, you can break it up into quarter periods, half periods, three quarter periods, and full periods. Now one thing you notice, if I take this and I drag it over here, that the sine and cosine functions actually look exactly the same if you move it a certain distance. So instead of zero, lining up at zero, they don't match. But if you move it pi over 2 radians, the cosine and the sine functions uh, match up exactly. And that's not a coincidence.
You'll also notice that the maximum value for the cosine occurs when the sine is zero, and the minimum value occurs when it's zero. So here are a couple of questions to think about. So the period of the sine function is pi over two, and the answer is true. That's because every two pi radians, we get a repeat of the behavior. Now if you had something like the sine of 2x, this doesn't have a period of 2 pi. It tur it'll turn out, we'll explain why later, this has a period of pi. Because, because of this factor of 2 and the argument, we are making things happen twice as quickly. So instead of taking 2 pi to happen, it happens at pi. Okay, so now that we've this is kind of like, okay, we've got a, a new parent function. So how do we handle things that are not like the parent function? So we have the same transformation behavior or um, ideas as we used back in the first semester. So I'm going to review transformations using the quadratic function, and then we'll extend that to the sine and the cosines. So if you remember, if we put uh, if we put the quadratic equation in standard form, uh, this x minus two is x minus h. So this this number here minus something. The something is is the x shift or the horizontal shift. So for this particular one, we're going to have a plus two horizontal shift. The vertical shift is just the straight number here, so it's plus five. So the vertical shift is plus five. And if the coefficient is out in front of the argument, then it's a vertical stretch. Now, if it's inside the parentheses, then it's going to be a horizontal shrink. So here's an example of where you have a horizontal shrink, where the two is inside the parentheses of the quantity that is squared. Now, if I just had 2x minus 1, that wouldn't properly um, reflect the, the um, horizontal shift. So uh, just like most of you didn't remember last semester, but you know, you'd factor out a negative sign to reflect if there was a x-axis or y-axis reflection. You do the same thing when you have a constant inside the parentheses that you're squaring. You, you factor that out of both terms. So, you know, this is equivalent to 3 times 2 times 2x, 2x, without the parentheses, 2x minus 2. And you might be tempted to say the horizontal shift here is 2 units, but it's not. You factor out the 2 so that you just end up with an x by itself here, plus x. And as a consequence, the horizontal stretch, I mean, the horizontal shift is one unit. So that's kind of a new thing that we didn't talk about in the last semester. So this is the standard form for a quadratic equation. This tells us the stretch, the vertical stretch. We typically factor this out, so there's really no case where we do a um, in most, when we put it in standard form, it's, we don't have a, a horizontal stretch or shrink. But um, for the sine function, what we do is uh, this is the standard form. And then I've got this modified standard form uh, because it, uh, and then I've modified it again to kind of match what we're used to seeing. So in the book, you'll see y is equal to d plus a sine of bx minus c. And um, so the A and the B are, this is a horizontal, I mean, a vertical stretch or shrink, and this is a horizontal stretch or sh shrink. But you can't, you can't factor out the B. I mean, in algebraic equations, we could factor out this number if we wanted to. We'd factor it out as a square root of 2. Here, you can't do that, so you've got to be a little careful. What I've done is I've factored the B from the X. But because I'm going to factor it from both here and here, you end up having c divided by b in the parentheses. And you can see if I multiply this back out, I'll get bx, and then b times negative c over b, the b's cancel out, you end up with c.
this C over B is the horizontal shift. This is the vertical shift. So what I've done here is I've just moved D, D to the end such that it matches up what with the way we look to transfer transformation. So, so if I wanted to say what are all these things, this is a, a vertical stretch if A is greater than 1. It's a vertical shrink if A is between 0 and 1. Uh, if A is negative, that is an x-axis reflection. So if A is greater than 1, positive 1, then you have vertical stretch. If A is negative, then you have an x-axis reflection. Okay, now the B part here, that gives you a horizontal shrink if B is, yeah, I got this wrong over here, didn't I? A is greater than 1. Okay, if, if B is uh, less than one and greater than zero. So that's also wrong if B is greater than one. Okay. So it's a horizontal shrink if B is greater than one. So here greater than one gives you a vertical stretch. Here it gives you a horizontal shrink if B is greater than one. If it's between zero and one, then you have a horizontal stretch. And also um, if B is negative, then you have a y-axis reflection. Now this number here is the x shift. So x minus the C over B is the x shift, and this is the y shift, or, or horizontal shift and vertical shift. Now another thing we're going to do is you can you can um, define these other quantities to, to rewrite this in the, from this standard form into um, using these two definitions. So here's the standard form, the one that we were looking at last. This is the vertical stretch or shrink. The sign gives you a horizontal, a horizontal um, reflection. B is B is greater than one. Then you have a horizontal shrink. C over B is the horizontal shift, and D is the vertical shift. Now the period, based on these numbers, is equal to two pi divided by B. So for our simplest case, B is one. So the period is two pi divided by one. So normally it's two pi. Now if, if this is 2, if you had 2x, you'd have 2 pi divided by 2, which we we said that, that earlier, I think somewhere here. Yeah, 2x, the period was pi. So if we use this equation, it works out. If b is 2, 2x, then the period is 2 pi divided by 2, which is pi. Now, the magnitude of a, which I'm showing is the amp absolute value of A is what we call the amplitude. It's basically how much this thing oscillates back and forth around some zero point. So this this is the amplitude, that distance. And because of symmetry, you know, this positive A, this is positive A, and this is negative A. So the the amplitude is the vertical distance from mean to minimum, mean to minimum, and mean to maximum. If a is negative, then the function is reflected across the x-axis, which is what we said over here. If a is negative, x-axis reflection. Now, how do you identify the period using the graph? 
so the amplitude is easy. There's always going to be some middle point here. This one, here's the x-axis. So this thing is actually vertically shifted by two units. But you can see that this is one unit above this center line, and this one is one unit below. So this is the kind of the mean value. And the amplitude is distance from the mean to the maximum and the distance from the mean to the minimum. But we're taking the distance and not. So even though this is plus, plus 1 relative to the mean, this is minus 1 relative to the mean, the amplitude is just plus 1 unit. Now the period you can determine by measuring from peak to peak or from valley to valley, and that's usually the easiest way to do it. Because this thing repeats itself, it doesn't matter where you choose. You could, you could choose from where this thing crosses this mean value to where it crosses the mean value again, going in the same direction. So from here to here, you know, we cross the axis, but this one's going down, this one's going up. So we want to measure from here to there. And you can see every, if I take this arrow, if I can take the arrow instead of that, okay. You can see no matter where I do that, it always is going to have a matching point. So if I, unfortunately now I got, I can't grab it. Let me just re, okay. So I can do that over here. You can see. So it doesn't matter where. Usually the the peak peak to peak. Is the easiest place because you don't have to worry about whether it's going up or down because it's the peak is always transitioning. So that's that's the uh, period. So you could you could find out where this x value is where you get the maximum here, and you could find the x value where this maximum occurs and measure that distance or take the difference between the numbers, and that would give you the period. And then you can measure from this mean to the max and the mean to the minimum, and that gives you the amplitude. Now what I have here is this same function, except, so this, this function over here is the sine of x plus 2. So it has a vertical shift of 2, but otherwise it's like a sine function. Now if I put a negative sign here, remember a negative out in front says it's an x-axis reflection. So what happens is this point, so let me just draw this mean line. So you see this point over here, which is here, flops down. Actually, it's, it's more like over here. So that point goes down below. Okay. Then I could say take this point. That corresponds to this point, but because that's right at the mean, you don't really. It doesn't. Sh it doesn't flip because it's right on the mean line. Um, this one, this point here, where the minimum is shifts over and becomes the maximum. So that's what an x-axis reflection looks like with the sine function. Now here's the same as the original, but we're adding pi to the function. So we're still, we still have this um, two-unit offset in the y direction. What happens is we, um, instead of, uh, what we do is we go back to this original function and we shift it pi units. So we're taking x plus pi. So we're actually shifting this thing this direction. So we're going to take this maxim, this point maxim, we're going to move to the left pi units. So that's going to move over here. This, this one will move to here. So we get this function. Okay, so this is the transfer function. The one that's black is the original function, which is the sine of x plus 2. 2x. So sine of x quantity x plus 2. That's this. This is what that looks like. And what I've done is I've just shifted it to the, to the left pi units in the x direction. Now, one thing you'll notice is these now look exactly the same. So the sine of negative the negative of the sine of x plus 2 is the same as the sine of x plus pi plus 2. Okay, so back to the, the different terms in the transformation. A is the vertical stretch. It's also the, 
amplitude, if you take the absolute value of A, it's the amplitude. D is the vertical shift. B is this horizontal stretch. And you can relate that to the period. Period is 2 pi over the vertical, or the horizontal stretch. And the horizontal shift is C over B. And, you know, this is a repeating function. So when you talk about the period, you're asking how quickly does the function repeat itself. It depends upon what this B value is. And then to find the exact value, you take 2 pi divided by that B value. So let's just, let me just look at, give you an example here. So let's say Y equals um, 2 times the sine of... 2x minus 2 pi. So this is almost in the standard form. It's not quite. So you might be tempted to say the horizontal shift is 2 pi, but that would be incorrect. What you need to do is factor out the 2, which is the coefficient in front of x, and you get x minus pi. So what we can say is the amplitude, which we say is the absolute value of A, is equal to 2. A is 2. So A is equal to 2. The amplitude, the absolute value of 2 is 2. Um, B is equal to 2. So that means the period is equal to 2 pi divided by 2, so it repeats every pi units. And the horizontal shift is is going to be plus pi units. So it's x minus h. h is the horizontal shift. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, plot these on my graphing program to kind of demonstrate how this thing works. So we're going to plot, first thing we're going to do, well, let's just plot the sine of, sine of x. And we're going to go from minus pi, 2 pi to plus 2 pi. And the y value is going to go from negative 2 to positive 2. Okay, so there we go. And we're going to change the view so the x units are some decimal of pi. Okay, so that's the parent function. It has one unit amplitude around the mean. So now let's, uh, let's just move this over. Let's look at this function. I'm going to plot it without in the original form, just to show you that it doesn't work out. So you get uh, 2 sine of 2x minus 2 pi. So that's the next one. So what you can see first is that the amplitude is 2. So instead of going from 0 to 1 and 0 to negative 1, it goes from 0 to 2 and 0 to negative 2. So that's reflected in this a value. You'll also notice that the red curve takes 2 pi units to, to have a full oscillation, whereas the blue curve takes pi units. That's what, that's what a period of pi represents. Now, there was no vertical shift, so we don't see that. So you can see that by factoring out this 2 out of both of these terms, we get the... Um, horizontal shift correct. Actually, we haven't talked about the horizontal shift. So what's happening here? Yeah, well, because the period is, is pi, when you shift it to the left, pi units, it's going to just be the same thing. So let me just show you this. So if I were to do a little 
if I were to do two sine of 2x without the 2 pi on there, you'll see that it, it's exactly the blue, the green and the blue curve are exactly the same thing. But if you don't, so let me, let me just, uh, if we were to put, say, 2x minus pi, so let me, let me add a page here. So if we did y equals 2 sine of x of 2x minus pi, this is not in standard form. So what we do is we would factor out a 2 out of this. So when you factor 2 out of that, you'll get pi over 2. So in this case, the horizontal shift is pi over 2. So if I put that in there instead, so I'll just put pi here. What you find is that now it's kind of looks like it flipped around. So what I've done is I've taken this and I've shifted it pi over two units, which is equivalent of making it actually flip around the x-axis. So there's a lot of equivalences you kind of learn if you if you do this a lot. Okay, so now I want to talk about just how to help guide sketching sine and cosine functions. And they're basically the same. They just they're just shifted. So as far as the slopes and the values, you know, you go between negative one and positive one. So what I what I've got here is a couple of comments. <clears throat> it turns out that when the uh, either the sine or the cosine goes through its um, zero value or the shifted zero value, uh, the slope is equal to the um, is equal to one or negative one. So here, if I draw the line y equals x, which has a slope one, you'll see that it corresponds very closely to the sine function. And then when you come up here, you have this curvature. We know the slope here is zero; it's flat. So we have to, we can't just go immediately from one to zero. So you have to have this kind of a transition period. And then you come back down here. When you go through zero, the slope is negative one, and here the slope is positive one. So you could draw these these lines, these slope lines of one slope of one, to help you draw a better sketch. Now one thing we'll find out later is that when the angle is small, that the sine of the angle is approximately equal to the angle. The closer you are to zero, the closer this approximation becomes an exact value. And you can see it here that because this this line represents y equals theta, and the red curve represents y equals sine of theta. Now the thing is you've got to have it in radians, so the sine of an angle in radians is equal to the angle in radians. And you can see that if you use a spreadsheet, so this is x, the angle in radians, and here's the sine of the angle. So when you're at 0.2 radians, which is probably what, uh, probably about 12, 11 degrees, the sine and the the angle and the sine are pretty close to each other, even at that point. But you get to a really small angle, like 0 0.01 radians, you can see the sine is 0 0.01. So it's a very good approximation. So if you wanted to do you know, a rough sketch, so I've, I've drawn a very rough sketch here, but let's, let's um, use what we just talked about. So we, this is the sine function. So zero, sine is zero, zero. At pi, which is 3.14149, it's about there. Two pi is 6.28, which is about right here. So these lengths should be about the same from here to here. You notice I've got a pretty square block. That's the important thing. So if I draw a line from here with a slope of one, it's gonna look something like that. And here it's a little harder to draw because this pi is not aligned 
quite right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line here and then I'll just move it. So I'm going to use the grid to line it up. So you get that and uh, so that's that's a pie. And then you can do the, you can copy this one here. Clone. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it like that. Now at pi over 2, which is 1.57, the slope should be z 0. So if I draw a slope 0 like that here, and that's at x, y equals 1, you can do the same thing here at y equals negative 1. And let's just, pi over 2 is 1.57, which is about here. It should be, it should be right between these two points as well, like here, that should be halfway between. And so you draw the curve. And so near here is pretty much equal to it. But then you've got to move away from it at some point, such that you can come up here and go through this point with zero slope. Like that. And then you go from zero slope down to approaching this this line and then you follow that line and then we want to go to zero slope here and if I was using pencil and paper I'd probably do a lot better but instead of my tablet so so using these lines y equals x y equals minus x shifted and so forth and then using this as a kind of a this is the maximum and then transitioning from slope of one to zero slope. So you can get a pretty good sketch. I think what I was doing here, I was just kind of ballparking it here, showing you how better you, how much better you can do with a little bit of guidance. And you know here is the actual sine function. So you know I could possibly grab this curve, slide it over and see how close it is, which is not bad. Right? Well, what if I get it aligned here? Right? So by using these guides you can get a pretty good idea of what the cut function should look like. Okay, so now we're going to just go through a, a number of different problems and there's a multiple choice, so I'm going to let you uh, try to figure out the answer and then I'll explain. So this is asking for the vertical shift of the equation. So remember this tells you the amplitude, this tells you the horizontal shift, this tells you the vertical shift. And you know the basic form of the equation is y is equal to a, we'll call it, call it the amplitude sine of a times x minus what actually we said it was, was ax minus b plus, um, I'm going to put a k there, the reason is because if I, if I rewrite this by factoring out the a, I'll have x minus b over a plus k, and in this case h is equal to b over a. So I have to put it in this form to have it a times x minus h. Well, this this is the vertical shift part. So the answer is c. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at how each one of these parts of this problem affect the graph. So we're going to start off with the parent function, which is the sine of x. Now if you go to the 3 times the sine of x, what that does is it just increases the amplitude. It doesn't change the period. It doesn't shift anything. It just changes the maximum value and the minimum value. Um, what this one would do is it would increase the everything by a factor of 5, so that would shift the blue curve up by 5 units. And this 2 would move it 2 units in the positive x direction. 
look at. Let's look at this one. The amplitude of the falling function. Well, the amplitude is just the number in front of the signed function. This this is the vertical shift. This is the amplitude. And information here deals with periods and x shifts. So so in this case is 2, the amplitude is 2. And this is uh, just demonstrating, you know, what is the period? The period is the distance from the values being the same and the d direction of change being the same. So what I'm meaning here is this has a value of, say, negative 0.5. Y equals negative 0.5. This has a value of negative 0.5. They're both increasing. Because we also have another point over here that has negative 0.5 as a y value, but here it's decreasing. So you have to have two things to be true to have the same to be looking at the period. The value is the same and the direction is the same. So if I were to move this to say here, the value is the same for these two points. And the direction of change, this one's decreasing, this one's decreasing. So this difference from here, this number minus that number, gives me the period. And, you know, obviously we can see it over here because we go through the zero point, but any two points that have commonality can be used to determine what the period is. You can use the, the location of the peaks, the location of the valleys. You can use the location of where it crosses. The, the good thing about the peaks is that even if this is shifted vertically, these are easy to pick out. Sometimes it would be pick, hard to pick out, harder to pick out where the midpoint is. You have to know where the, the vertical shift was to figure that out. Now, if you have something like the sine of 2x, well, remember the period is 2 pi over, I'm using b here, but it's really what I had previously was a. So it's 2 pi over 2. This is the coefficient. So the period would be pi. So the blue curve is the sine of 2x, and the red curve is the sine of x. So you can see that when this number here is a number greater than 1, then we have a horizontal shrink taking the red curve and we're pushing it so that we hold that point and we just move it to here and then things happen twice as quickly. So I'd say this is a horizontal shrink. If you had a number between 0 and 1, then you would have a horizontal stretch. Okay, so what is the period of the following sine function? Well again, all we have to do is pick two points that are similar and again the peaks be easy to do so I could take that distance and then I could pull it down to the x-axis to use this as a, as a guide and you see that the distance is pi over 2 um, you know, if I chose the distance between the valleys then you get the same thing and also you get the same distance between these are both 0 and they're both increasing this has 0 but it's decreasing so the answer is pi over 2. Now the actual function would look like it would be y equals the sine. And because um, things are happening more quickly, remember the normal sine function, the parent function, takes 2 pi to go for one full oscillation. In this case it's happening over pi over 4, which is 4 times faster. So this red curve is the sine of 4x. And remember the period, if we want to look at the period, it should be, with this equation, the period should be pi over 2. So you take 2 pi divided by this coefficient 4, and you see that that simplifies down to pi over 2, which agrees with our conclusion. The period of the following equation, again, the, the this is the only number that affects the period. This is the amplitude. This is this involves the horizontal shift, and this involves the vertical shift. So, the period is not four pi, but the period is 
2 pi over 4 pi in this case. So that would be 1 half. So the answer is 1 half. Now, if we were, if we were to plot this, what we would do is you would factor out 4 pi. So you'd have x, and then you'd divide this by 4 pi. 4 pi, 4 divided by 4 pi would be 1 over pi. So we'd have plus 1 over pi minus 3. So the amplitude would be 3, the period would be a half, and the uh, x shift would be equal to minus 1 over pi. Not minus 4, but minus 1 over pi. And this shows what happens when you have a vertical shift. Here's our parent function as a period of pop 2 pi. The vertical shift doesn't affect the period, doesn't affect the amplitude, which is the distance from this center line to the maximum and from the center line to the minimum. The center line has been shifted two units. So all, all that's been moved, this everything's been moved up two units. And that's in this previous problem, that would be shifted down three units. Now if you look at a horizontal shift, that's this number. So if you have, again, the parent function is the sine. Here we have the sine of x minus pi over 4. So it's x minus h. So the shift is plus pi over 4. So the peak moves pi over 4 in the positive x direction. The 0 moves pi over 4. The 0 moves pi over 4. Everything moves pi over 4 in the positive direction. The key thing, you know, the tricky part people have problems with if it was the sign of 2 pi minus pi over 2. You might say the horizontal shift is pi over 2, but that's not what it is. You factor out the 2. So to factor out the 2, you divide this by 2. 2 pi divided by 2 is pi. And then you divide this by 2 and this should be um, x, 2x, not a 2 pi, but 2x. Just wrote that wrong. OK, let's try it again here. So you factor out the 2, you got x minus pi over 4. What this does is, what that number will do is it causes a horizontal, this is a horizontal shrink. Because the period is going to be 2 pi over 2, which is pi. So that means things happen instead of in 2 pi, they happen in pi. And then this tells you the shift in the graph. So this is the, you have plus pi over 4 x shift, not pi over 2. So don't read it directly. Got to factor out the constant. OK, the horizontal shift of the following equation. So here's an example. We don't, we don't have just x by itself. So you have to take the original equation, factor out the 3 inside the parentheses. So divide this by 3, you'll get 1. Divide by this by 3, which is negative 4 thirds. But remember, it's, it's x minus h. So h is positive 4 thirds. I didn't give you a choice to do negative 3 4 thirds. Period and amplitude of the function are, OK, so we have negative 3 sine of x over 3, or 1 third x. So remember, the period is 2 pi over this. My origin looks at this a, b, now it's a. So a is this constant. So you'd have 2 pi divided by 1 third, which is 2 pi 
times 3 firsts, take reciprocal, so you get 6 pi. So that's the period. T is the period. And the amplitude is the magnitude of this thing. So the amplitude always is positive. So it's going to be 3 is the amplitude, and the period is going to be 6 pi. And so here, the, instead of 2 pi, to take one oscillation, it takes 6 pi. That's because this number here, 1 third, is between 0 and 1. And that's a horizontal stretch. And here you can see what they look like. So this is this, the parent function. The negative causes this thing, instead of having the maximum first, you have the minimum first. So this flops, flips from here down to there. The one third causes this thing to be stretched out. So instead of having, here's one oscillation, two oscillations, three oscillations, it takes the same amount of time to do one oscillation in, the, in this equation as it does three in the old one. And the amplitude is three, so this distance, instead of being one unit, is now three units. Okay, the period and amplitude of this function. Again, this is the amplitude. It's the coefficient, absolute value, the coefficient out in front. And then the constant in front of the x is pi over 10. Call that a. So we said the period is equal to 2 pi over a. And we have pi, which is about 3, 3 tenths. So this is going to be a horizontal stretch because pi over 10 is, is between 0 and 1. So you get 2 pi over pi divided by 10. And we convert this into a multiplication problem. So we take the reciprocal, multiply by the reciprocal, and the pi's cancel out. And we get t is equal to 20. So the answer was, we said the, the, mag, the uh, amplitude is two-thirds and the period was 20. And here's a picture. So we have the cosine function. The amplitude goes from one to two-thirds because of the coefficient in front of the cosine. And because this number is um, less than between 0 and 1, it's going to stretch this thing out, which it does. And if we measure the distance between, say, the troughs or the peaks, if we look at that, you'll see it goes from 10, minus 10 to plus 10, which is 20 units. Okay, so let's talk about these examples. Um, it turns out both of these give you a reflection across the x-axis. The one that we're more used to seeing is a negative sign out in front. But if you look at this particular case, so I'm going to plot the sign of x. So we're going to do the sign of x, and we're going to go from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. So we'll graph that. So we get we get two oscillations. Now if we were to take if we were to reflect this across the x-axis then this point would go down here just staying the same x location but flipping the y. The other option to get this maximum down as a minimum would just be to shift this sine curve horizontally by pi units. This is 1.5 pi and this is 0.5 pi. So whether we add or subtract pi, we're going to end up with the same result. So if you go the sine of x minus pi, <coughs> and we plot them, that's the same as if. So now we'll just put it the sine of minus or minus the sine of pi minus the sine of x and the sine of x minus pi we get the same curve 
and if we add pi we'll get the same result. So the sine of x plus pi. And you get the same answer. They're all three on top of each other. Another thing you can think about is um, if I took the sine of x that would be the same as the cosine of x. Uh, well, let's, let's plot both of those. So the blue curve is the cosine, the red curve is the sine. You can see if I shift the sine curve back this way, negative pi over 2, they should align. So let's do that. So the sine of x is the same, or the cosine of x is the same as the sine of x, but plus pi divided by 2. Now by adding pi over 2, I'm actually shifting the red curve to the left. And you see that they're the same thing. Another thing I can do, instead of adding pi over 2, I could subtract 3 pi over 2. So what that's going to do, the sine function would be here, and if I subtract 3 pi over 2, I'm going to take this peak and I'm going to move it over to there. And you can see it gave, gave me the same result. So there are a lot of different ways of, of looking at these transformations to give you the same thing. So what I said was the cosine of x is the same as the sine of x plus pi over 2. I also said the cosine of x equals the sine of x minus 3 pi over 2. You can do the same thing, the sine of x. If I go back to this curve, so let's, let's plot the sine and the cosine again, just by themselves. So what I did here was I shifted the sine this direction. I could shift the cosine that direction, and that they should coincide with each other. So I'm going to take I'm going to take the cosine. And I'm going to subtract pi over two before I took the sine and added pi over two. And there you go. Pitched up. So so what I could say is the sine is the cosine of x minus pi over two. I could also say the sine of x is the cosine of x plus 3 pi over 2. So it's kind of the opposite of what I did here. Let me just show you that. So this is the sine of x equals the cosine of x plus 3 pi over 2. And you see nothing exactly the same. So what do we need to plot in sine and cosine functions? You need to answer the following questions. What is the period? That depends on the coefficient in front of the x. What is the amplitude? That depends upon the number in front of the sine or the cosine. The amplitude is always positive. The vertical shift comes from either a number added or subtracted to the sine or cosine. Whereas the horizontal shift is inside the parentheses, inside the argument of the sine, but you have to factor out whatever coefficient is in front of the x out of both terms to correctly do the horizontal shift. You've seen that. So let's just look at another few more examples. So here we have y equals the cosine of 2 pi x. So the, the amplitude is 1 because the coefficient in front of the cosine is 1. There's no plus or minus added to the x inside the cosine so the horizontal shift is zero and there's no number added on the outside and then the period is 2 pi divided by 2 pi which is 1 okay um, and I graph the function here so the only difference is that uh, the period is 1 so I go from 0 to 1 and I go from 0 to negative 1 and it looks just like an all cosine function except it's it's a horizontal shrink. Now here we have a sine function that's shifted 
And because there's no coefficient in front of the x except 1, we know that the horizontal shift is going to be negative pi over 4. Uh, the period, the coefficient in front of x is 1, so the period is 2 pi. There's no number in front of the sine, so the amplitude is 1. And there's no number outside, so the horizontal shift is 0. So let's just uh, take, make this, uh, actually let's, since we're going to break it up into four parts, let's make this 2 pi. And then half of that would be pi. And half again would be pi over 2. And pi over 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. And then you have the same thing in the negative direction. So this is negative pi over 2. This is negative pi. This is negative 3 pi over 2. This is negative 2 pi. OK. Now the sine function starts at 0. Since this is one full amplitude, I know that after quarter, one full period, quarter period it goes up to, to the maximum amplitude, which is one. It goes up to the amplitude one, then it goes back down to zero, then it goes to negative one, and then it goes back to two pi. And you can see the symmetry. Here it's positive one, here it's negative one, here it's zero, here it's positive one, here it's zero. And then we could draw lines you'd have to make sure that you were had these these square blocks here are not really square because of the um, the way I've done the scaling so you can't just draw a line straight through here it's going to be a little bit higher but if I go up like that and then loop around and come back down and then make a straight line through this part and then loop back around and make a straight line as I go through the the midpoint and then loop around and then go back down here and then do it like that. So that would be that particular problem. Now here, you know, four things we need to know. The period, well the coefficient in front of x inside the cosine is 1, so the period is 2 pi. The number outside the cosine is 2, which means the amplitude is 2. There's no term either added or subtracted from x, so the horizontal shift is 0, and the number outside the cosine, but not multiplied by the cosine, is 3, so everything gets shifted 3 units. So you can see uh, I've got from 0 to 2 pi, which is one full period, and negative 2 pi to 0, so that's two full periods. I've shifted the x-axis by 3 units, so that's where the function is going to intersect. It's not going to intersect the x-axis, but it's going to intersect the line y equals 3. There's no horizontal shift. So I can draw my cosine function. The amplitude is 2, so I go 2 units up from this center line and 2 units down, and I draw these dashed lines to guide me. I can't go below or above that. And then I plot the cosine of 0 is 1, cosine of the full period is 1, and then you go 1, 0, negative 1, 0. So this is a quarter of the period, so we've got you know, 8 units here for full period, 4 units for a half period, 2 units for a quarter period. So 0, negative 1, or 0, maximum, maximum value, minimum value, 0 maximum value, not 0, but the midpoint. Now what we have here, sine of x over 3, so the amplitude is 1 because the coefficient in front of the sine is 1. Uh, the coefficient in front of x is, is 1, so the period is 2 pi. The amplitude is 1. There's no adding or subtracting a number, so the horizontal shift is 0. And there's no number added outside, so the vertical shift is 0. So all we're doing here is we're, is we're increasing the period from, uh, well, the one we're plotting, this is the, this is the um, parent function, but this one, you have a is one-third, so pi, 2 pi divided by one-third is 6 pi. So instead of going from 0 to 2 pi, we actually go from 0 to 6 pi, 
so I probably should have rescaled this so I went one full um, oscillation was from 0 to 6 pi okay let's see if there's anything else I want to talk about okay one last thing is uh, you know where do you see the sine function being useful well a, a lot of times is uh, vibration so the position of some object as it vibrates they tend to follow a sine or cosine relationship uh, another example is is this temperature if you plot the uh, average daily temperature or maybe the average max looks more like average maximum temperature for a location um, this is the blue dots here are the actual values and this purple is a model of it it's a model in terms of using uh, sines and cosines sine or cosine because you can see it has just from looking at the actual values you can say it looks it's going to be periodic because every year it's going to repeat itself uh, and why would this behave in a sine fashion well it probably depends upon the amount of hours of sunlight which does the does end up being a sine function so it's not surprising that the temperature might follow some kind of a similar situation and here's one for Chicago now what you see is in Tallahassee because it's in the south and it's near the coast you get a much smaller fluctuation so the amplitude of this would be much smaller than the would be smaller than the amplitude of this but they both uh, similar kind of thing you know that these actuals are a little higher here than the model but they they are periodic and they uh, are close to a sine or cosine function now how do you determine the period well the period would be 12 months uh, which city has the greatest variability that would be Chicago you see the amplitude is bigger so what part of the equation represents this? Well, it, the amplitude. So here, this question, you just look at the graph. If you had an equation, you would look at the amplitude. And that's it. And you'll do the homework problems that I have assigned, that I have attached.